Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, my guest is Heather Lean. She's the author of Angel Grandma, Love Grows Here, Grieving Children, How We Can Help Children Process the Impossible. She has a tremendous story. I'm excited to have her here and uh, share with you, the audience, what we've learned in the grieving process and, and all the other things that life has thrown our way. So with that being said, welcome to the show, Heather. Can you tell us your story? Thank you, Art. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. My story starts, you know, essentially about a year ago. My mother passed in April, April 4th of 2019. And, you know, she, she was battling Alzheimer's for nine years. So it was it was a long time. We all kind of knew at some point this would happen, but no one was really quite prepared for it. Myself, especially. I have two children at the time. One was one year old and three and just a lot going on, a lot to handle. And after the funeral, we, you know, we were down in Florida. She, she was living in Florida. We came up and it was just pretty much back to life. You know, you had to go back to life pretty quickly, back to work, back to like all your duties. And I just, you know, everyone else goes back to normalcy. But for me, I was like stuck. I just felt, you know, I felt the pity. I felt the grief for myself. I felt, you know, anger. I felt all these emotions and I didn't really let them out. I, you know, I just, I kind of bottled it up and I found myself, you know, I'm an attorney by day and a mom. So it's like two full jobs as it is. But I found myself like in the the file room, just starting to cry as I'm pulling out files, you know, and, and it just came out at these moments where, you know, you bottle stuff up so much and it'll, it'll creep up on you. So, you know, I had a coworker tell me, Heather, just take some time off, like go do what you have to do, go grieve. And I'm like, I can't, I don't have time for that. There's no time, you know, again, like I was just so focused, like, you know, this, I, there's work to be done. I got two kids. I can't take time off to like go to a spa or just go to a, you know, a retreat or, or do anything for myself. And after that, I just started to search for something, some kind of coping, some kind of something to like ease my emotions because I realized it was eating at me. And I, quite honestly, the first thing that opened the door was a meditation. I was looking at, I think it was like Joe Dispenza had this meditation and he's like a science background and he's telling people how, you know, kind of explaining the science behind the brain and how the emotions work and, and reconditioning your mind and not letting all these emotions eat at you because, you know, as I know now, like all diseases and all these things are, are from your body, not at ease. And I certainly was, was not. So I did one meditation and it kind of just opened the door. I mean, from there, I couldn't even tell you what happened in sequential order, but I was like, I drive quite a bit. So I listened to a lot of audiobooks, and it started, I think, from there. After that, I was listening to Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. I was listening to Eckhart Tolle, you know, The Power of Now. And I, it really opens this whole new world for me, I have to say, because it taught me how to change my thinking and think differently about things. And I remember listening to Hill's, you know, Napoleon Hill. It's actually think and grow rich, but it's it's kind of misleading because it's more than just, you know, business and money. It's it's a whole different, you know, he, he talks about a wide range of things, including the spiritual element. And he's like, when an idea comes to you, just go with that. Don't, you know, don't silence it. Don't, you know, talk yourself out of it. And I was, so this is all kind of going on at the same time, but I was, I had this idea and originally it was at the time I started to contribute to an orphanage in Africa. I just saw something on Instagram and, you know, I felt very connected with that because, you know, here's, I'm at the time I was 38 when I lost my mom and here they are, they're two years old, three year old little children and they, they're orphans. They have no parent. And I'm thinking to myself like, wow, so grateful that I had my mom as many years as I did. Here's these children and I saw pictures of them and, you know, they're so happy and they have so little. I'm like, well, how is that? You know, like in our society, it's like you just want more and more and more, like more things. How can these people be so happy with so little? And I remember giving them just like a little bit of money and I got this video back from them. And I'm not like going to cry because it's the first time in my life. I mean, I've always been like a giver. I've always wanted to help people in need and I felt always emotionally attached to that. 
But this like, it hit me because I felt like almost in there, you know, they're orphans, like they have no parents. And they're sending me this video back. We love you. God bless you. Thank you so much for your donation. And, and it's the children like, you know, saying this to me. I opened up that video. My daughter was there and I just started crying. I was like, I don't know. This is like touching me. Like this felt better to me than anything I could buy. And, you know, like I, before all this, I kind of got into that self-therapy. Like I'm like buying clothes and shoes because it's like the thrill of buying something and then you get it. And it was so, it's just such an empty void I was trying to fill. And obviously that didn't do it. And then when I got this video from them, I'm in tears and my heart was happy, but I'm like crying and I'm like, oh my God, I got to do something. And I was driving my car and I'm hearing Hill's, you know, Hill's speech on this. And he's saying, when you get an idea, just run with it. So my first idea was I want to write a book and instead of giving money to them, like, you know, here and there, maybe I can donate a a net portion of the proceeds and like donate to them and, you know, and help the foundation that way. And so that was the first book that I wrote. It's actually, it's uh, Letters of Love. I wrote it about the actual interaction between my daughter and this orphanage. And, you know, I do intend to publish it, but I thought I was just the one, I thought that was the only book I had in me. So now I open up this door and between meditation, between, you know, learning to deal with my emotions and really kind of harnessing all that to something productive. Now I went home and I started writing books. Like I just thought this was the only book that I had. I've since written 10 children's books and, you know, Angel Grandma wasn't the first one. I don't think it was even the second one. It was something I knew I wanted to write in my heart. I knew from the beginning before I even knew I wanted to write a book, I wanted to write like a poem or or something for my children. And I kept putting it off because I wasn't ready to deal with those emotions. I knew when I opened up that door, like, I didn't want to cry. I didn't want, I didn't want to do any of those things. And then I remember one day that, I mean, this is, you know, after I wrote a couple of books, I'm thinking of my mom so much and I was in a grocery store and, you know, a couple things like kind of happened. And it's a funny story, but like, I was thinking of the salad dressings. I saw it in, in the grocery store. And as I'm going to check out this, I love you balloon gets caught in the conveyor belt. And then my, you know, the, the cashier had to pull it out. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Thinking of my mom, salad dressing, I love you balloon. And I'm walking to the parking lot and I see like, you know, feathers all around me on the floor. And then I see them falling from the sky. So I'm just like, okay, that's a little weird. But I just went home and I'm like, I have to write this book. And I think it's just a sign to me. So within a day, I wrote it down and it all came out, you know, flood of tears, but it's not a sad book. It was me letting my emotions out about my mom, me knowing what I kind of knew in my heart that she's still here and me having to write that down. So I knew I wanted to do it, but I just wasn't ready. And when I was, it just all came out. And within a day, you know, the book was written. I was like, I have to go with this book first because I'm so, you know, it was for me, but it was also for my mom. So I'm like, I wanted to get this out before her, you know, her one year anniversary of her passing. And that's what pushed me to like, to keep going. Even when things got like little, blips came up along the way or whatever. I, I knew because I was so in tune with this with, you know, my heart, like with for my mom, that this was the book that I wanted to go with first. So I, I wouldn't stop. So that's why I chose Angel Grandma. I have other ones in the pipeline being, you know, being uh, illustrated and, and done. So that's exciting. But I knew I had to how to take this one first. So that's the story behind it. And I and I wrote it, you know, several months ago. And the funny thing is I even asked a few people you know, you get a bunch of opinions when you ask people things like, you know, now with the timing with everything, is this the right time? Like, I don't want people to think I wrote this book for everything going on in the world. And, you know, a bunch of people said, no, you wrote this book for your mom. You know, I couldn't predict what was happening, but I don't want to delay it because I I really feel like it could help people. Like it's helped me and people that have written, you know, read it it's a comforting book. It's not like a depressing book or anything like that. It's just, it's just reminding people that they are still here with us. So I think that's a message now that people could, you know, could help them. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. 
The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. I think that's great. You know, and and there's a whole bunch of it you've covered that touches me. And I don't know if you know this about me and my experience with an orphanage in Vietnam. But when I was in Vietnam, I came out of a, I was a Marine machine gunner in Vietnam. And we were coming back off of a long range patrol and had been out for days and crossed this river into this village that was about a couple miles from our main base. And as I came around the corner of this little hooch and started walking across, you know, through this little area, I looked over to my right and I saw these two little eyes looking up through a chicken wire fence and just glaring at me. And when I looked at these eyes, I saw myself as a nine-year-old and I thought, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And when we got back to our base, I asked the chaplain if he knew what that place was where all the kids were. And he said, it's an orphanage. Mm -hmm. And he said, I go there all the time. And, you know, it's a Catholic orphanage and I pray with the kids and, and I help as much as I can. And I said, well, there was a little girl that I saw and he, he said, you know, there's lots of little kids there. So, you know, I said, can we, can we do something? It was getting near Thanksgiving time. I said, can we do something to help them? And I came up with the idea that we should have them to our main compound for Thanksgiving. Uh And they would fly in helicopters. They would bring us turkey and mashed potatoes. I guess you could call it turkey and mashed potatoes. (laughs) It was was similar to to, to turkey and mashed potatoes. But I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we all shared with the kids in the orphanage? So I asked the chaplain when he came back out to our compound, I said, do you think this could happen if we could get the kids? I said, a lot of my Marine buddies are all for it. You know, we thought it'd be good. And he said, well, I'll have to run it by the CO, you know, the company commander to see if it's, it can happen because, you know, you bring kids in from an orphanage into the compound, they can be spies for the Viet Cong and they can plot out the whole, everything we have in the compound and it could actually be a detriment. But making a long story short, we got it approved and the kids came. And the day wow. that they arrived on Six Spies, they were all jumping off the back of the truck and the little... Aww girl that I saw was actually looking for me and she ran into my arms. And for the next two years, I I left about nine months after that to come back home. But I had gotten my parents to help me support them, the kids and and in there. And it it got into a big thing that we did that helped a lot of orphanages in Vietnam. But I continued to support her and send her to school and all that. Wow. And in the Tet Offensive in 1968, Father Volch told me don't send any more money because I had been sending money since 66 wow. uh, to support her. And uh, he told me that during the Tet Offensive, the orphans were used as a shield between the oh. North Vietnamese and the Marines and Army. And they were all the kids were lost. So oh it just I guess the point I'm making is. Every one of those rough, tough Marines that were out there with me, we felt so good giving back. Yeah. It made it worthwhile. It gave purpose to everything we were doing. And that's the important thing about giving. Yeah. When people give and open their heart, it's a sharing night like no other. Right. And it really, really benefits. And, you know, you said you were asking around your work, you were asking for people's opinions of, you know, should you be doing this? (laughs) Don't ever ask for anybody's. I know. Just just do it. Heather, you're doing it for all the right reasons. You've got the support of a lot of people behind you. Just do it. Don't worry about what other people think. Just don't ever worry about it. You know, and sorry you lost your mother. I mean, it's in 2006, I lost my wife of 38 years to ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I know the feeling of loss. You probably did a lot better than I did because when I lost my wife, I fell apart. Yeah. But you know, in the process of falling apart, we learn so much. 
in the process of trying to hold ourselves together. We learn so much. And that's one of the things that I'm noticing about our conversation today is that I wonder what separates you and I, because we're very similar in how we look at things and how we perceive and process, but there's people out there who totally lose it when they lose somebody. I mean, I I have a friend who I was with in Vietnam who is totally the opposite of me. I mean, I used everything as a learning experience, everything to him as being a victim. You know, Vietnam is what ruined him, it ruined his life and all that. And I keep on trying to tell him over the past 50 years, I said, you know, it's you, it's how you look at it, it's how you perceive it. And of course, he's fluffed me off about it. But have you put any thought into what what makes you so different about handling the process? I think I have a handle on it. And I hate to be almost say this, because I don't want to sound elitist, or like I'm above anybody. And I know you and I are both grounded in, in helping people and love and kindness and caring. But I think it's in the ability to intellectually process grief. Right. You know, children don't have that. And what you're doing to help children through that process is tremendous because they don't know how to intellectualize yet. Their brain processes haven't got there, but ours have. And we're doing that. But there's also adults who can't process it, you know, who who fall apart. I mean, I fell apart for two and a half years. I was a jerk. I mean, I wasn't the person mm-hmm. that I'm I was or who I was or could have been. But, you know, I got back on track. You know, my kids kind of helped me get there. But the biggest thing that helped me getting there was writing. Because after two and a half years of being a jerk, after my wife passed, I started writing. Yeah. And writing is so cathartic and just so, so empowering when you write and you see your words. And I think you just process it different. So I think, yeah, I mean, I I definitely always, I guess I got some experience in it. I've always been that, you know, not, not to say the black sheep of the family or whatever, but I always thought differently. You know, I was always like intrigued by things just, you know, and I wasn't really, I wasn't brought up religious. I'm Jewish by nature. I'm married. My husband's Protestant. I didn't find so much in religion, so much comforting in some, some respects. Yes. But I think, you know, with my mom, even like having the Alzheimer's and dealing with that, you know, she right away, like very quickly, you know, just stopped talking and there was no communication. And some people were just like, and I saw like my own family members were saying, she's just a vegetable. She's not there. I'm like, I'm like, how can she just be, how can you just be not there? I mean, I get it. She's not talking, but she knows me. Like I would go there and other people that kind of discounted it and just said, you know, she's no longer there. It's not her. She's just a shell. That's what they got when they saw her. But when I was there, I have pictures even, you know, I was there with my daughter. I don't start crying or anything now, but there was always something. There was always a connection. And you know, I felt that right away. Like I got almost practice in this spiritual awakening, if, if you want to call it that, as you know, she was going through the ends of her, her disease because it just got to be so bad that she could barely talk. She can barely swallow. But, you know, when I was there and she heard my voice, she would turn, her eyes would look to find me. And I'm like, you can't tell me that somebody, even if they lost all faculties of talking and comprehending that that connection, that love connection is still not there. It's there. It's just maybe she's like in in a coma in a sense. But like, I feel like I would always be connected to my daughter, to my son, if I heard their voice, if I noticed their presence. So that to me is where this all started. Like, I think my willingness and ability to open up to something, you know, bigger than me, knowing that there's a spiritual connection, because I saw that in my mom when and when everyone else kind of not everyone else, but some people were just like, it's not her anymore. She's just not there. And I, I just refused to believe that. Maybe I'm just stubborn, but you know what? I saw something in it that made me realize she is still there. You know, like our soul or whatever, that, that's always there. And even when they do pass, you know, they're still, they're still with us. And I feel that. It's not like I, I didn't write this to like, you know, patronize anyone and just say like, look, you know, they're all around us. I feel that. I've sensed that since. And a lot of things that helped me were, you know, meditation, quieting my mind, not listening to all those negative voices, you know, and that's really helped me even, even in present day with everything going on right now. I'm just, I'm more like connected and I can, I can calm everything down. So 
that really opened the door to me to everything. I, I think that one meditation, and then I just haven't stopped since then. Almost like eight, nine months, I, I try to meditate every day. And it's the only time I have for me. So like I, you know, thoroughly enjoy it, but it, it actually calms me down. And it's opened up, you're right, like it's opened up this window. I didn't ever think I was going to be a writer. I think I enjoyed writing it, writing as a child, but, you know, I didn't study. I wasn't an English major. I didn't, you know, go to school for that. But, you know, I'm not writing for a newspaper. I'm writing, I'm writing for my heart. Like this is all, you know, I can have someone edit and and help me, you know, kind of tweak it, but everything I wrote, it's coming straight from my heart. So I don't think anything could be wrong. And, you know, like if people resonate with it, they don't, that's fine too. But you know, it goes back to the point like of releasing it now during this time. I didn't want to come off as insensitive, but that's why people tell me, look, Heather, you wrote this a genuine book for your mom and your and your love and the connection between you two. So don't worry about that. You know, if people think that's insensitive, you know, so be it. I'm, I could help people. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. I think when, when you write from the heart, when you speak from the heart, write from the heart, and act from the heart, can't do any wrong. Right. There is no right or wrong to that. It is who you are. It is authentic. And authenticity is picked up by people faster than anything else. <laughs> people pick up. I mean, you're, you're an attorney, you know, and I don't know what kind of law you practice, but when you do depositions and stuff, I mean, you know, almost beforehand, you know, right. what it, what is coming from somebody's heart and what is coming from somebody's coaching, right. you know, in, in <laughs> the deposition and all that kind of stuff or, or on the stand or yes. however it is, you know, I mean, words can be manipulated, but your heart can't. Right. And when you speak from your heart, those words can't be manipulated. They're from your heart. And right. it is, and if you're right. If somebody doesn't like it, that is their prerogative. That is their thing. Right. There is a million other people out there that need to hear your message. Right. That the timing of your message will be perfect because, you know, we're going through this pandemic right now yeah. and people are living in fear. I mean, yeah. in, I know you're in New York and you, mm-hmm. New York is hit the hardest of any place in the country. Yeah. I mean, massive amount of people dying every day. Yeah. And people need to hear this message, Heather. I mean, they I just know. absolutely need to hear it. It's weird, too, because I, I had originally you know, planned on launching the book right before my mom, my mom passed away on four, four. And then her birthday was on four five. So I was like, Oh, I want to get everything out and launched and all the stuff before her birthday. And then with everything going on, it kind of got pushed back anyways. So yeah, I had this all planned out before <laughs> any of this stuff happened. But you're right, it's just, it's a little crazy dealing with all the fear. And I definitely allowed myself to get caught up in that for a little bit. But then I just I keep reminding myself the fear, the stress, the anxiety, that's doing more harm than I think, you know, obviously the disease is very real, but when you're low not to get all, you know, techie and stuff like that, but when you're lowering your body to that kind of constant stress, I mean, I'm not a doctor. I don't, I don't know specifically all the, you know, the, the technicalities behind that. But when I was dealing with the stress, just even with my mom and her sickness, and I got run down with so many, you know, colds and stomach bugs because I let the stress eat at me. And, you know, I decided, I mean, even when she got diagnosed, you know, I was counting in my head, okay, I have 20 more years left before I'm going to get diagnosed. It was that kind of crazy mentality that I was letting get to me. And someone actually asked me that recently, like, oh, are you worried you're going to get the disease that your mom got? And I was like, you know what, like, in the past, I I was, but I'm not living in that reality anymore. I'm not going to let my thoughts dictate what's going to happen to me. Like, you know, 
maybe I am susceptible to it, but maybe thinking I'm going to get it is going to trigger something in me. So I just, you know, the power of your thoughts and keeping in a good alignment, even when the world is crazy around you, I just think, you know, I can't belabor that point enough. I'm dealing with friends and people who are in extreme fear. And, you know, I try to tell them, like, obviously there's some, you know, you got to be cautious. You got to do the right thing. But this fear, it's like, it's eating at you. You need to find another more productive outlet. And I'll even send them meditations. I'm trying to help them, you know, like do this meditation, calm down. Even if it's just like, you know, for an hour, just to relax yourself, do something, turn off the news for a little bit. Don't, you don't need to see the numbers every single second. And, you know, I'm not telling people to not realize what's going on, Mm -hmm. but I think when you're in constant fear mode, it's not helping you. You know, there's nothing, I can't control outside what's going on in the world. I can only control my thoughts and my feelings and how I react to it. So, you know, you got to, like slow down a little bit. And that's like my only recommendation. I know like I'm in, in, you know, New York is, is bad now. And, and, you know, I still take all the precautions when I go out, if I have to go out, you know, go food shopping or something, I try to get it delivered, but there's no ever delivery available. So, you know, I have two kids at, at home that are eating nonstop. So, you know, but I think that's the, the only message that I can tell people is just to like, you know, try to control your feelings a little bit and not let the fear run you. That's what I do with my clients right now is that I tell them you take all the precautions you can, every possible precaution not to contract this terrible virus. You do all that, but there's at some point where you just have to say, I have faith. I have faith that I'm going to be okay, that everything is going to turn out the way that God planned it. Right. And you know, that that's in faith, but I have a friend in Toronto, Dr. Brindusa Avanta, who is doing research, has been over the past 10, 15 years on the the correlation between stress and fear in correlation to your health. And the numbers are staggering, the people. And she is working with cancer patients that have, have been diagnosed and who go into that mode of fear that I'm going to die from this disease and all that. And then the people, she studies the people, both of those groups, the one that doesn't believe it, who I'm going to be that and I'm going to do this and all that. The numbers are staggering. The numbers are staggering for people who have positivity in their life versus that negativity. Right. See, and I believe that positive and negativity in our lives come from our expectations. That's my my area of expertise is expectations. When your core expectations are based in the positive, positive things happen throughout your life. When they're based in the negative, negative things happen. You know, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Henry Ford or who it was, but Mm. you said who you are, who you think you are. Right. That is maybe one of the truest statements I've ever heard. Don't know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So, what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. I have a question for you, and I'm not going to try to put you on the spot. Just quickly, Mm -hmm. you think you could identify your three core expectations? Well, as far as like what, I want in the future or, you know, just what your three, everybody has core expectations. Okay. Just to give you some hints. Mine are love, connection, and integrity. I mean, those, those are my three core expectations. Everything I do, I do with integrity, love, and the power of communication. So, you know, I think, I mean, not, not to like, not to like steal yours. (laughs) I definitely, you know, I think all my, 
all the books I've written have come from a place of love. You know, this is the love I had in the connection with my mom. And then the other books I've written, it's actually being uh, illustrated now, like, isn't it a miracle and love grows here. And, you know, so I, I'd say that's the central theme. And more so than anything, I, I want the books to get out there so that I can help people. So, you know, that's my motivating factor here. So I guess that, you know, and then to help orphans and help children and give back to, to children. So yeah, and I think everything I, I'm doing right now is, you know, it is authentic. I'm writing from my heart, I'm not writing like, and I'm not researching or whatever, or anything like that. It's, it's an idea that comes to me. And it's something that I feel and it's, it's just funny, because I, you know, I went on the spiritual path, like on my own, I was, you know, voluntarily looking for coping and to get me through this grief. And I think a lot of people now, you know, it's like forced solitude, forced introspection, and it's not comfortable to a lot of people. I did it willingly on my own, but I think a lot of people are struggling now because, you know, it's under, under force. They're home, they're, you know, they can't go out, can't go out and can't be around friends. And it's like all the solitude and all these emotions that maybe they put off, you know, for a long time. And now it's surfacing. And I've seen that in some friends and some people I interact with. And, and, I think now just the timing of the books too, like it's me on this spiritual path, but I think it could help, you know, it's written for children, but it's coming from my heart too. So my hope is just like even parents that don't have time to deal with their own emotions, if they're reading these books to their own children, it could help them as well. So it's like, you know, I think, I think me, it's like love, authenticity, and then just like the willingness to like, I want to help people. And that's, you know, all my books so far. I'll tell you what they what I think they are. And I wrote them down before you and I <laughs> went into this part of the conversation. In the early part of this, I wrote down these. These are what I feel are your your three core expectations. Love, authenticity, and caring. Oh my God. <laughs> Those were the three that I wrote down. That's really funny. Yeah, you know, and I, I believe they are. And I think that that makes you who you are. And I think that that's, you know, people buy who you are and how you make them feel more right. than anything else. And when you come from the place that you do, then, you know, you'll be okay. You know, everything's going to be work out. Use this whole experience as a learning experience because it's all meant to teach us something right? so we can teach others. You know, if we all teach, if we all taught our children what we have learned through this living process that we go through, our children would be so much more I know. advanced. But you know, they have to learn these things on themselves. That's one of the things I love about children's authors, because children's authors are all trying to teach children lessons to help ease them into this thing we call adult life, which is ever changing every single moment. I mean, it's changing faster than we ever yeah. could have imagined with computers and all the things. The world is connected much more so, you know, I'm going to be 73 in August. And, you know, it, the world has changed so much since I was a kid. Right. And then I think back of your mom and dad, and my mom and dad, and their, my grandparents and all them, how this world has changed. When I was in college, I did a paper. I had to do a, this is even before videos were even popular, but the professor asked us to do interviews with people that we admired. And I had a real difficult time trying to find somebody that, <laughs> and not, not finding people I admired. There was a lot of people that I admired, but I wanted somebody really interesting. So I went to a nursing home and I found a woman who was 103 years old. Wow who still had her faculties. She had wit and humor and stories that were just great. And she told stories about seeing the first airplane, wow. seeing the first movie, seeing the first photographs, things that we in 1960s were taking so for granted. Yeah. All the things she had seen, the Great Depression and what it had done and all the things that she had learned. And she said to me, life is always changing. What has kept me so young is I've changed with it. I've changed with life. And I thought, you know, that's pretty cool. Here she's lived all these years and she's seen massive change. 
And I got to thinking back on my own life. My mother, who I also have Jewish blood in me, my my grandmother turned Catholic to marry my grandfather <sighs> back in the 30s, I guess, 20s or 30s, which wow. at that time must have been something. Yeah. They were in Brooklyn. They were in New York. Wow. But my mother was someone who lived in the past. She did not live in the present or future. I can always remember my mother saying, I wished I had done. I wished I had this. I wished my father had done this because her dad was very wealthy. Yeah. Worked in Wall Street in the 20s, but lost everything during the Great Depression when the stock market crashed. Mm -hmm. And her thing was, I wished, I wished, I wished. You can wish all you want. It doesn't change a thing. What changes something is when you stop wishing and you start doing something about it. Right. And that's what we should be teaching our children and trying to teach our children. Absolutely. I agree. I mean, I have, I mean, not going to point the person out, but I have someone in my family, that same thing too, blames everything on the circumstances of, you know, his life or whatever and growing up. But, you know, I grew up in a divorced household. It wasn't, easy. And, you know, I could blame everything on all the things that I went through in my life based upon, you know, oh, this is because my childhood was this way, or, you know, I grew up this way, but what good does that serve? And, you know, I totally agree with that. Like you have to move forward. Like I'm not living in the past anymore. I'm living now, you know, like I'm living for my now and I'm, I'm enjoying, you know, this, this, even everything going on has brought on a new perspective. Like I'm, my kids are like a little crazy now. They're like two and four. So like bouncing off walls and some days are very hard to like wrangle them and keep them occupied, but I'm enjoying time with them. And I think, you know, we're like, we're all forced to like go through that now we're living in the now. Like, and I hope in a sense, it doesn't go back to the, you know, rush, rush, rush. No one can sit down and eat dinner together. No one can sit down and spend time with their family because I think we all needed this to realize like what's important. You know, it's not about the car and the this and the clothes. And it's like, what brings you happiness? And everything in my past that has led me up to this has led me up to now. So I can't be angry at the circumstances. I can't, you know, say like, I wish my parents never got divorced. I wish this never happened. It's all made me who I am today. And, you know, I'm grateful for that because, you know, even, even my mom's passing, I would love to have her back, but obviously something you know, there's some other plan in place that maybe I would not have even, I probably would not have opened up this door. And, you know, it's what makes you like pushes you to the uncomfortable that makes you realize you have to change. You have to grow. You can't stay where you are. If I stayed where I was, I'd be probably still depressed and, you know, self-pity and saying, why me? Like we, we lost two grandmothers in less than two years, my husband's mom and then my mom. So in the beginning, I was like, I have no grandma to share anything with. Like, I, who can I send 10,000 pictures of my kids to? No one's going to want to see that. And I was having that self-pity. And it was just me in that, like, loneliness. And I had to move out of it because it didn't serve me. It made me sick. And I was like, I have to find another outlet. And, you know, this whole path, it's been a spiritual one. But it's been, like, an awakening for me because I, I do have faith. I, you know whether or not you believe in God, source, spirit, any, anything you want to call it. I believe there's something greater than us and we have a purpose here. And maybe I would not have realized this purpose that I feel I have now. I hadn't, not everything happened to me up until this point. So I can't be anything but grateful for where I am right now, even despite all the circumstances. And you do have to change because the same is not an option. You just, you know, it's not a good place to be. So I agree. I think you're 100% on point. I mean, that is, it, it is. And uh, you've said it eloquently that, you know, you just can't stay the same. You know, no one wants to live in that space. Right. Though people do. You know, I mean, yeah. there's people who do live in that space. And I guess that's what you and I are trying to tell the world is that you don't have to live in that space. Right. It is a choice that you make. And yes. you either choose to stay in that space or you can move out of it. And I think you've given everybody enough information and tools here to move out of that space. And that's what makes Heather lean so beautiful. (laughs) That's what makes those eyes sparkle and smile on the world. I can't say enough thank yous for that. 
I don't Thank know you. a better way to end the show than on that note. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I have some tears in my eyes now. You make me cry, but no, well, I really appreciate this. And um, It's okay to have tears in your eyes because yeah. I have joy in my heart from, from hearing you. Thank you. And having you share this. And I want my audience to reach out and be able to share with you and, and learn more about you. Where can they do that? The book launch is actually coming out the end of April on Amazon. So it should be um, Angel Grandma and Amazon will be available. And they can follow me on, on Facebook. It's um, Heather Lean Author. And Instagram is the same, Heather Lean Author. And Twitter is just Author Lean on Twitter. So they can find me. You can search in Lean, L-E-A-N. <laughs> you'll, you'll find it. But yeah, Heather Lean Author and then uh, Author Lean on, on Twitter. And it will be in the show notes. So everybody will have access to your website. And I'm going to encourage everybody to really connect with you. You're special. You're a gift to the world. And uh, you're going to have great success with your launch or your book. And I'm going to encourage everybody in the audience to grab a copy. And you won't regret it. It'll really help you through this time and place that we're all at in this country. And just thank you, Heather. I mean, it's thank been, you, Mark. It's been a, a pure joy. And I'm going to uh, tell the audience, you know, where you can get a hold of me or at Expectation Therapies, my email, write to me. And expectationtherapy.com is the website. And I'm going to let Heather White take us out of here. And Heather Lean, thank you very much for being on thank the show. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.